public people will be on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, um, I'll introduce you and then we'll just do uh, setting motivation for your class and then I'll leave it over to you. Okay. I'll, I'll do a, just a, just a, a, a bit of a thank you to everybody because we're at the tail end of our series. So just give me a few minutes to open yeah, up the comments. Yep. <clears throat> okay, Allison. Okay. okay, we're streaming now. And Oh, there's Lulu from London and Judy from Istanbul. And Judy, are you in Istanbul? You just got hit by the earthquake? Wow, yes. Mm. I can't hear you, Judy. <clears throat> no, I said we didn't feel anything in Istanbul. Oh, you didn't feel anything? Okay, good. I'm glad to see you. Nice to see you. <clears throat> been a while. Yes. I guess we only get to see you on the weekends. So, so we have European friends. There's Per and Per, I can't remember, is it Sweden? Are you in Sweden? I can't remember. Uh, Lorraine and Susan and Catherine, that must be Catherine in Hong Kong, welcome. And our friend Keith, Noble Keith and Susan and Annette and my buddy Stu and there's Sylvia. Kareen, Sharon in Boston. Okay, welcome everybody on there's Dr. Landsman. Okay, good. <clears throat> so we have a few friends, maybe a few more will trickle in. Just give me a minute and whoever is joining us on live stream, welcome. I'm just gonna uh, give everybody a few minutes to roll in from emptiness into form. And, uh, and then we will, and there's Annette. Welcome Annette. And Deb. And Erica, I know Erica has been looking forward to this. Uh, this is going to blow your minds, folks. So those of you that are lucky enough to have the karmic fortune to join us for this presentation, you will, will out without doubt, money back guarantee, love this drop. <laughs> Nothing like over promising. <laughs> and there's Amanda in the Canary Islands. Okay, good. Lucia, let me see your face. I haven't seen you. I, I've been thinking about you there in London. Let me see you when you jump. I'm literally in the middle of cooking. But... That's, that's, that's okay. We can, we, uh, what are you cooking? Some granola, morning uh, porridge? What are you having over there? I'm just making some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> well, good nourish that body. <laughs> and there's Carrie. Good and Deb, good morning. Okay, Ian, these are all my friends. We are, we are so delighted, so delighted to be there together. And there is uh, Joe. Good, Joe. Nice to see you. Okay, well, that's enough to get started. Uh, we'll do a uh, quick introduction uh, for our great guest today, Ian Baker, and, uh, and then we'll set our motivation and let him carry us through into the netherworlds. Mm. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, just thank everyone who has been on the ride. Contemplative Studies program has now reached its uh, penultimate module and the last class of the penultimate module. So we have been together uh, more than a year and a half and have made our way through now seven uh, modules together. And uh, so congratulations to each and every one of you that began uh, almost a year ago in April, more than a year ago in April. <clears throat> And those of you that have come halfway through, welcome and congratulations for catching up. And uh, you should have all feel very good. We should rejoice in all of our merits for having stuck through it. You guys are a very earnest bunch and it, it makes me very proud and happy to, to, to be on the ride with you, especially in a time where there's so many choices and so many distractions and so many other places to be. The fact that you've uh, persevered through COVID and kept your Dharma studies so, uh, so vital. Uh, and really been uh, a very, very healing space to join each week, each and every week. So, as, and we're very fortunate in our last module here to have so many great uh, teachers come, including Tashi Monox and Carmen Mensik that we started our workshop with and all the way through Rachel Wooten and Dr. Landsman. And uh, uh, of course, Tupton Jimpa. And most recently we had Glenn Mullen and Lama Sultram Olion. So we are very, uh, very, very fortunate today on the last class of the Tantra module to have Dr. Ian Baker with us. Dr. Ian Baker holds a PhD in history 
and a master's in medical anthropology and was designated by the National Geographic Society as an explorer for the millennium. So that's a very cool title. <laughs> he has undergone prolonged meditation retreats in the Himalayas under the direct guidance of some of the greatest luminaries of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, including Chatral Rinpoche and Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. Now, any of you that were on the Nepal pilgrimage with us in 2018, there was a moment where we were up at Parping and we were invited, if you remember, some of you were there, Stu and Kim and a few others, we were invited into uh, 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 a little house by a woman named Saraswati who blessed our malas and gave us a short talk with Peter. And that was the daughter of Chatra Rinpoche. And so we were basically in Chatra Rinpoche's house. And that was uh, Ian's first teacher uh, Chatra Rinpoche, great master, was one of the ones that introduced him into the whole idea of the Baal, the hidden valleys, and uh, initiated him in a way into these great uh, traditions. Uh, so Ian is the author of numerous books and peer-reviewed articles on Tibetan cultural history and tantric Buddhism, including the latest book, Tibetan Yoga P Principles and Practices. Uh, which he'll be talking about today. And he also authored uh, The Heart of the World, A Journey into Tibet's Lost Paradise, which I highly recommend his, his uh, sort of adventures into these Baal, these hidden lands. Uh, that if you ever needed anything to capture, cap, uh, capture the imagination, that would be a great book. And also he's the author of The Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, which I was referring to in our last class where some of these great uh, these great wall murals and paintings of the Mahasiddhas and uh, of the tradition of the Tantric Yoga are depicted. Uh, I think it was Sixth Dalai Lama, his, uh, his meditation temple behind the Patala Palace. Uh, so Ian had direct access to those uh, wonderful uh, examples of Tibetan uh, art and uh, did a very good synthesis that I think uh, at the direction of the Dalai Lama. So I think he's, he's, a, he's definitely been sort of appointed as a kind of emissary to, uh, to reveal some of these things. So it's a great honor. It's a, it's, a, it's a very historic, unprecedented access that I think Ian can really provide for us. And he was the lead curator on the acclaimed 2015 exhibition, Tibet Secret Temple, Body, Mind and Meditation in Tantric Buddhism um, by, the, by the London's Welcome Collection. And some of those, uh, some of that uh, footage is available for free on the uh, on YouTube. You can just uh, Google Tibet Secret Temple and you'll find Ian there uh, curating some of the uh, wonderful pieces and uh, art uh, from, that, from that exhibition. His website is ianbaker.com for those of you that want, it looks like that was under construction. Uh, so that'll be up soon, I'm sure. And otherwise there's ianbakerjourneys.wordpress.com for those of you that want to uh, find further information on Ian. And let me just say, it's a tremendous pleasure. Ian and I were just discussing our, both of our, uh, our uh, entries into Buddhism. And there, there's a little fortuitous story is, uh, you know, I, I got my start through a college abroad program and junior year out of Wheaton College where I went to Budgaya. And that's where I met uh, uh, Tokul Urgun's son, Chokinima Rinpoche, who became one of my first teachers in, in, in when I was just 20 years old. And I, Ian had a, a very similar story, though. He's from an earlier generation uh, where at, uh, from Middlebury College, he took his junior year abroad studies and went to Nepal. And uh, that's how he got his start. And that's where he met Chachal Rinpoche. So, you know, these meetings, these sort of so-called chance encounters at very uh, early ages, they make huge lifelong uh, imprints. And, and now we're both in a situation where we want to cultivate interest and uh, preserve tradition, but also make innovations. And uh, that is definitely one that I'm, I'm hoping more uh, to hear from, from, from Ian, because he's really uh, making an innovation with the Tibetan practices that were once considered very secret and are now uh, and now a few a few key people are coming forward and and started making them more uh, accessible, and and that could that that is sort of exactly what we're going to talk about today with some of these very very uh, refined subtle body practices from the Tibetan tantric yoga tradition, and so join me in welcoming Ian and also by the end let's let's. Uh, 
let's try to lure him back to contemplative studies program for more because this is just the beginning, I hope, Ian. It is a great, great honor for us to have you. And I'm, I'm very looking forward to, to meeting you, getting to know you and spending more time, uh, so, so more, some more time with you as, as the years unfold. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Miles. Now, um, do we switch to my, okay, I can switch to my screen. <laughs> Um, sorry. So Miles, thank you very much for that very kind um, introduction. Uh, what I want to speak about um, today uh, at your kind invitation is uh, Tibetan Tantric Buddhist Yoga and Illustrated History. Um, and so if anything isn't showing up here, please let me know. Otherwise I'll assume that uh, we're on. Um, so as Miles kindly introduced, my first introduction into this world was in 1977 on a college semester abroad program uh, to Nepal. Um, and it was really around exactly this time of the year, as I remember very distinctly around Halloween that I met my first teacher. And so it's, it's interesting, I'm speaking to you now from the Scottish Highlands where the tradition of Halloween uh, as a word actually first uh, emerged to our English language. It was All Hallows' Eve, and it really referred to a time in which we venerate those who have departed, especially saints and spiritual figures. So although we have this kind of wild uh, imagery that we see in Tantra, there's also this sense of its relationship with the, um, the Tantric Buddhist world. Um, uh, sorry, with the with the world of, of you know what we understand of Halloween as a time when, as it's described here, where the world is thin. So, um, what I've been asked to do is kind of give a kind of summary of the what I've described in my book, uh, Tibetan Yoga uh, Principles and Practices, um, which just came out last year. And this is really an introduction to you could say the inner yogas of the. Um, Tibetan Vajrayana tradition. And, um, you know, I'm just going to make a little break here because normally when I'm speaking, I see a little window uh, indicating that um, I'm actually online and speaking. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to make a short little um, break here. Um, Okay, so I just, I'll continue in any case, and if there's any problem, hopefully I'll be alerted to it. So as I mentioned, this uh, book, which came out last year, is an introduction to the inner Vajrayana tradition. And as Miles also introduced, you've been, this is kind of a culmination of your contemplative uh, studies program, in which you've been introduced to the foundational Theravada teachings of Buddhism and to the Mahayana, which developed in the early centuries of this the current millennium. Uh, re-emphasizing the, um, the, the, the path of compassion and also at the same time um, bringing in, as it were, uh, deities uh, into the Tibetan Buddha, into the Buddhist path, which had really not been part of the early, um, or at least not an overt part of the early Buddhist traditions. So I want to also emphasize, um, as Miles also introduced, that this is not just sort of academic uh, work, but something very much part of my own uh, personal experience. Um, and this goes back, for example, to uh, the image we see here. Uh, this was in the meditation cave of Yeshitsogyo, who was the- uh, Ian, may, may I interrupt? Um, we're not seeing your share screen, so can you- oh. Can you try to um, relaunch the share screen? Yes, and... I, uh, yeah, that's what I just sent to a message because I wasn't sure. I'm gonna, you know, I didn't know why that wasn't working. So let's, because I didn't see my message there. Um, let's try this. Um, is that showing so far? Uh, and... That's it. Yep. If you you go back to the first slide yep, and go press back play. To the first slide. I'm gonna pitch play, and then I should see the little window up there. I wasn't there, so I will start again if you don't mind the whole thing. Yeah, that would be great. 
Okay. But I don't know if you were hearing me or you weren't before. Just... Uh, we were hearing you. We were hearing you. Okay. Well, I'll, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was happening because there was no little image. So let's just see. Okay. Now, fine. Now uh, I see the windows to the right. And, and I'm going to give you a thumbs up if you ever need any questions. Just look for me. I'll give you the thumbs up if you have any questions. Now it should be, I think, pretty clear. Uh, so just to kind of review what I started with, I wanted to, uh, to say that it's really been a great uh, privilege to be able to Uh, thumbs up if everybody can see that he froze. Did he? Is it just me? Uh, Ian, if you can hear us, uh, you're frozen and we'll need to resync. He went offline. Okay, good. So maybe he's refreshing. So these are the, we're all experts now in the technical glitches of Zoom and cyber interactions. So just let's remain in a good open receptive state and hopefully he'll be springing out of the emptiness very soon. And just while I have some of you, maybe this will warm your heart. Geshe Tenzin Zopo not, uh, just will send me a message saying he's very interested in coming on pilgrimage with us in 2021 if we can avoid or find a vaccine. And that's a three-week pilgrimage that I'm planning, and that not only goes to one country but two, starting in Nepal and going all the way down to the Vajrasana, the Diamond Throne in Budgaya. And so th those are two places that both Ian and I started our journeys. And uh, when I sent that information to Geshe-la, he replied back to me with two words, I'm in. So apparently there's a wild storm where Ian is. So he's trying to jump back on. He lost uh, he lost his service for a second. Let's let's hope let's hope that we can cut through the obstacles. Appropriate for Halloween. And Ian has rejoined us. I'm rejoining, and as I said, I'm sorry. There's a kind of a wild storm raging here in the Scottish Highlands at the moment. So my internet kind of went off for a bit and that's why it froze. And um, hopefully it looks a little bit calmer, although the wild leaves are still sort of appropriate for a full moon uh, Halloween. But I'm going to go back to the shared screen um, and um, let's see, we'll hope to resume this. Uh, and there we go. And if there's any issue, please let me know. Um, but I will 
in the interests of just uh, understanding that this will be screened again later uh, and obviously hopefully edited, uh, I'm just going to start again uh, with a brief introduction. So uh, in this uh, presentation on Tibetan Tantric Buddhist Yoga, uh, an illustrated history, uh, which Miles uh, very kindly introduced, um, I want to say it seems a very auspicious day for it since it's Halloween here in Scotland where I'm speaking from. All Hallows Eve, as it literally means, was a time in which one venerates and gives respect to one's uh, the departed uh, uh, teachers. Uh, it's also a period when uh, the world is considered to be thin. And Samhain, which was the original tradition, it was one of the, the fire festivals in which um, to illuminate the darkness. And it was uh, essentially the harvest moon, which it also coincides with today. So it's a very volatile and at the same time, very exciting period. And of course that speaks to the very nature of Tantra itself, which I think we see embodied in this particular image. Um, and this is what I will hope to sort of contextualize is to show how images like this, which are so imaginative, so um, dynamic and how these relate to, to Buddhism as which is a path as we tend to think of it uh, from its earliest iterations as a path leading away from kind of the um, the strife, but also kind of the the uh, sometimes uh, um, um, let's say mm, the excitements of the world that can lead us into to uh, less than than noble paths. But what we see here is a very dynamic image of enlightenment in this very often radical uh, iteration. So. Uh, these are uh, practices that I write about extensively in this recently published book of mine called Tibetan Yoga, Principles and Practices. Uh, this is the cover of the UK edition. There's a different cover uh, for those who might uh, know it from the US edition in which there's a, uh, a, a yogi showing the, the chakras and uh, light channels within the body. Um, but the insides of the book are exactly the same in both editions. So I also wanted to emphasize that um, although the book takes a scholarly approach to the material, um, it's also very much based upon my own personal uh, journey, uh, which is began in 1977 uh, when I first went to Nepal uh, and met with, with my first teacher, Chattra Rinpoche. Um, and it continued over, um, uh, over many years. Uh, uh, with many trips into Tibet, in this case in the so-called Enlightenment Cave of uh, Yeshitsogyal, um, here above Terdrum in central Tibet with uh, a Nakba Yogin from, uh, from Nangchen in eastern Tibet, with whom we were practicing in her cave called uh, Kandro Tsokpo Kiryongzong, which is about 17,000 feet high in, um, in the central part of Tibet. Uh, this is, uh, again, just to kind of give a geographical context for these kinds of practices as they emerged in Tibet. Um, that cave that you saw is up at the very, towards the very top of the mountain in the center here. Uh, you can actually see uh, a kind of a dark space uh, just below the central uh, peak, uh, slightly down to the right. And that's the cave in which Yeshe Tsogyal is said to have uh, been basically the first Tibetan to ever achieve enlightenment um, in the eighth century through the practice of the yoga of inner fire or tumul, which we'll talk about a bit more as being, and as I think you've also heard about in the context of Glenn Mullen's presentation on uh, the six yogas as being the pillar and foundation of the six yoga tradition. So we'll speak about that more. Uh, but this is just to put some of these practices into a kind of geographical and visual context. So here we see that uh, same Nakba Yogin, uh, Lelong, Lelong Dorji, uh, performing rituals on the way up to the cave where we stayed in retreat. And this is the cave of Yeshitsogyal. So this is a very, very important pilgrimage site uh, in Tibet because it does represent the place where, interestingly, the first Tibetan uh, to have achieved enlightenment according to the Tibetan tantric path, uh, according to the, the uh, Buddhist tantric path was in fact a woman. It was Yeshitsogyal who had been born a princess 
and become a queen and then became the, the student uh, disciple consort of Padmasambhava in the eighth century. And so this is still um, a, something that, so a very powerful pilgrimage place, although very, very difficult to reach. And here again, we see the same yogi um, representing this early path of the Nyingmapa uh, as opposed to the more monastic uh, traditions of tantric Buddhism that developed in Tibet in subsequent centuries in which we, which many people tend to identify Tibetan Buddhism with today. But what I'll be speaking about more in this talk are the inner yogic uh, tantric Buddhist practices as they were originally brought to Tibet uh, by non-monastic, non-celibate practitioners. Uh, also wanted to uh, speak briefly about my own uh, introduction into this world uh, of Tantric Buddhism through Chacho Singe Dorji Rinpoche, shown here uh, in, the, in Nepal, uh, and also on the left, uh, one of the hidden lands in which uh, Chacho Rinpoche often set up his kind of yogic camps, if you want to refer to it that way. And this was a place called Pematang, the, the lotus fields in the hidden land of Yomo. Uh, in northern Nepal, not far from the Tibetan border. And this is a whole tradition of hidden lands, or beyu, as they're referred to, which are considered to be places where if you practice these yogas, they become, they're more effective. And we're literally, supposedly, one day a practice in a, one of these hidden lands is equivalent to weeks, months, or even years uh, in ordinary places. Uh, and again, uh, being Halloween, uh, it's sort of a time when we can begin to consider how these more radical practices associated with flayed animal skins, animal heads, multiple arms, multiple bodies, uh, entities entwined in sexual embrace, how do these relate to uh, what we understand of early Buddhism and its path of renunciation? And then more importantly, as Buddhism evolved into its greater emphasis on the creative imagination that, and its connection in turn with emptiness. Um, this idea of that uh, form and emptiness, emptiness and form. So all appearances essentially as being mutable in our own experience. So these are things that we can begin to, to see how they're played out within the inner tantric Buddhist yogas. I uh, also wanted to speak in that context, again, partly because it's Halloween. I know you had a recent talk by Lama Sultra Malioni uh, about the practice of Chud, which was in some respects, as I'm sure she mentioned, a kind of integration of pre-Buddhist shamanistic practices in Tibet uh, with the tantric Buddhist practices connected with charnel grounds, places, again, where the world is thin and whereby embracing fear, embracing uh experiences that we would normally uh, avoid, um, we can uh, attain to a, a deeper and more profound understanding of the human condition. So with Chud, as we see here, it was invoking um, a, as we know, a fierce uh, deity in the form of a goddess uh, who would essentially decapitate one, uh, in which therefore in doing so by imaginatively creating this kind of inner drama, uh, one becomes progressively less attached to that which we are most attached to, which is the physical body. And yet, at the same time, the physical body is the, um, the vehicle par excellence of the inner tantric Buddhist tradition. So in that context, we see really these two, the ways in which Buddhism uh, kind of took a new direction, uh, really beginning in the 6th and 7th centuries with the emergence of the tantras, which were actually originally uh, texts, they were instructional texts that expanded upon the Buddhist sutras. So if we think of sutra, even etymologically in the word sutra, meaning thread, and therefore like suture, which is our, which we understand in the English language to refer to a thread which connects um, in, in a medical sense, the tantras literally mean to expand um, and to weave. And so they therefore expanded upon uh, the Buddhist sutras in this embrace of the physical body as opposed to the rejection of many of the sensual aspects of, of human experience. And we see that kind of in this particular detail of a wall painting in uh, Bhutan, where we see a monk on the right and we see a, a tantric yogin on the left with the customary meditation belt, the long hair, the conch shelled earrings, 
and the other uh, sort of insignia that distinguish uh, a practitioner of the inner tantric yogas from the more conventional monastic tradition. So entry into the, the, the tantric Buddhist tradition was customarily by introduction into a Buddhist mandala uh, signified by one or another tantric Buddhist deity. So here we see one of the earliest uh, of the tantric Buddhist mandalas and uh, based upon the, the, uh, the Hevajra Tantra, which appeared from the eighth or the ninth century. Uh, it's contested as to which of those two centuries it first appeared in. But essentially what we see in microcosm here is a whole iteration of the tantric Buddhist path both in its creation phase, as it's referred to, the Kirin in Tibetan, in which you use the creative imagination in order to conjure from emptiness uh, a range of human possibilities that activate our inner potential. Uh, and then the completion stage in which those same visualizations are dissolved and the mandala is reconceived as being um, uh, coextensive with one's own inner anatomy and psychophysiological processes. So what we see, for example, in the mandala here uh, is the deity Hevajra uh, embracing Nairatma. Uh, so when we understand on an inner symbolic level, what that represents is the, uh, this is the first time that a, a, a Buddha has been shown sort of in, in, an up, in a non-sitting posture, in this case, in a dancing posture with Nairatma. Nairatma literally meaning the, the selfless one, in other words, in, a, in a, a embodiment or anthropomorphic form of emptiness. So what we're seeing here is form and emptiness. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing um, all of the kind of uh, the union of opposites in a dynamic representation with the eight yoginis uh, surrounding um, Hey Vajra. All of these have deep symbolic meaning in terms of the inner practice of Hey Vajra, in terms of the circulation of energy and subtle essences uh, within the physical body. We also see around the mandala, the eight charnel grounds. So again, if we look back at those earlier images of the should practices, these were ideally to be practiced in charnel grounds. And charnel grounds were places again, where, where the world was thin, like we understand it to be, for example, in, in this current uh, period of, of Halloween. Um, in which practices like it is now with the full moon were particularly efficacious. So we see that even prior to the emergence of the Hevajra Tantra as one of the first uh, Buddhist tantric texts, we see the Guya Samaja Tantra, the assembly of secrets, which appeared perhaps one or even 200 years previously. In this case, the Buddha seen here behind in blue, uh, in, in erotic union uh, with multiple hands, um, with different implements representing the expanded capacities that arise as a result of these kinds of practices, which were no longer turning away from the sensual world, but actually transforming it through the power of creative imagination and dynamic practices of, of vision and energy. Uh, so if we look at how the tradition of Tantric Buddhism understand, well, if we look at the origins of this, we can see, for example, that coextensive with what are referred to as Yogini Tantras, in other words, the the Hevajra Tantra, this is the on the right uh, detail of what we saw in that earlier mandala, is an ecstatic Buddha um, embracing his consort, holding the Vajra in the right hand, um, in the case of the, the, the consort, and also in the case of the uh, Hevajra figure himself, holding the, a bell, which is partly hidden by his right hand, representing um, the penetrating, the emptiness, uh, wisdom aspect of enlightenment, and then the skillful means, which he holds in his right hand as the Vajra. So what we actually can see, as well as the trident, uh, having multiple distinctions, but what we see here with the rise of the Yogini Tantras, mostly from the eight, between the eighth and the 11th century, was simultaneous in the Hindu tradition with the rise of the so-called Bhairava Tantras. And we see Bhairava, for example, in this uh, early uh, uh, statue on the left, um, essentially having many of the same attributes uh, as the Buddhist Tantric deities. And we see that in the sense that this was the rise of what was called the Shak Shaktiism or the Shakta traditions, representing a emphasis on the female 
uh, power um, within the Shaiva tradition of, in other words, those following the Hindu path of, of, Shiva, of Shaivism or uh, where Shiva or, or was the primary deity, although representing on a subtler level, Shiva meaning pure awareness, pure consciousness. So what we see is concurrent uh, development of the so-called um, Shaiva Tantra, particularly in its emphasis on fe female deities um, within the Bhairava Tantras and the Yogini Tantras in the Tantric Buddhist tradition in India uh, prior to its going to Tibet, but also uh, at the same time. So if we try to understand what the beginnings of all of this was, we can look towards Gandhara up on the Northwest frontiers of the Indian subcontinent. We see here in this very early stone statue, a Buddha on the lower register and what really appears on the right. And again, this is in Greco uh, Hellenic style because this is actually the first images of the Buddha were actually created by as we know historically um, by Greek artisans who came with Alexander in the fourth century, third century BC uh, into the Northwestern frontiers of India, bringing with them their, their artistic traditions and representing the Buddha, as we see here in that lower register um, in kind of Ro in a Greco Roman form with a toga and a hand held up in the standing posture. But what we interestingly see above that is a, a very uh, kind of Dionysian sensual scene. Um, and these were very early representations where there was no overt connection between them uh, in this case, uh, between you could say the Buddha image uh, below and the kind of Dionysian scene above. But what is interesting about this, however, historically is that this is the same region where the Buddhist tantras are said to have emerged uh, from the 6th, 7th, 8th century onward. Uh, we also know that when these areas were began to be invaded from the 5th, 6th century uh, or even earlier, uh, they, there were over 1400 Buddhist monasteries in this area that where the monks had to flee into the upper valleys of the Hindu Kush mountains to the north. This is the area of Udiana the legendary um, Buddhist land, also known as the land of the Dakinis, which is where Padmasambhava is sensed to have originated, and which we'll speak about in a minute. So if we try to understand how did the Mahayana traditions of, um, of uh, Udiana or of Gandhara transform into the tantric traditions of, of Udiana, uh, we can possibly imagine that the monks uh, and nuns of this tradition fleeing from uh, their destroyed monasteries into the upper reaches of the Hindu Kush mountains encountered, as we know existed, uh, Dionysian traditions um, that had been established in that area from early Greek um, travelers. And, uh, and we also have a very strong archeological evidence in the Swat Valley, for example, of a viniculture, in other words, of, the, of wine and, uh, and ritual dance, for example, elements that became actually quite emblematic within the Vajrayana Tantric Buddhist tradition. Um, and we, again, we see the sort of ecstatic quality uh, on the deity to the right, the Tantric deity to the right, uh, as being perhaps an inheritance of this meeting of East and Western traditions on the Northwest frontiers of, of India, which was essentially on the Silk Road, which were also the Musk uh, the Musk Road, the Tea Road, many uh, a lot, an area of exchange of both ideas as well as goods. But if we look at the tradition itself, for example, the way that the Guya Samaja, the first of the uh, the Buddhist tantric texts that emerged uh, in India, is described, this is according to a version of the Guya Samaja Tantra's origins, as it's described by a Tibetan. Uh, which we'll see. And it, as it states, King Indrabhuti, now King Indrabhuti was the so-called, the king of, uh, of Udiana, of this kind of legendary tantric uh, land, of the land of the Kinis, as it was called, uh, in the northwestern frontier of northern Gandhara. Uh, so King Indrabhuti, with his retinue, proffered many offerings, asking, please teach us and those like us a method for liberation from the suffering of the life cycle. The master, knowing his mind, said, go forth from homelessness, and there is a way. In other words, uh, kind of advocating the original Buddhist teachings of, of, of renunciation. The king, again, making offerings, replied, since passionate beings like us cannot renounce the five objects of sense desire, please teach us a method for liberation in which one does not renounce those things. 
The master transformed his appearance into that of a universal, sorry, it's a little hidden on my screen, deity, and emanated the 32 deity mandala of the secret assembly, Guya Samaja. He initiated the king and his retinue, taught them the tantra, and entrusted it to them. So this is the story of Indrabhuti, um, according to Pema Karpo in the 16th century. And essentially, this is a kind of origin story for the emergence of the first of the great uh, Buddhist tantras um, in this legendary land of Udiana that, as I mentioned, was really on the Silk Roads of east, between East and West, uh, in which traditions uh, not long after the Buddha, there was already evidence of a kind of Dionysian traditions involving the kind of transgressive practices that we come to associate with the Yogini Tantras centuries later uh, in other parts of India as well. We also see the image of the of Guya Samaja on the left here, uh, originally as a seated Buddha, multiple armed. Um, and these were also practices that were the subtle body practices that we tend to associate with the inner Tantric tradition were first um, um, described. We also see that King Indrabudi, who, as we saw, was the king of Udiana. Udiana is also where Padmasambhava, who is also known in Tibet as Urgyen Rinpoche, in other words, the precious teacher from Udiana, is said to have come from. So Padmasambhava was the adopted son of King Indrabudi, a long, kind of wonderful story connected with that. He was also the tantric sage who was invited to come to Tibet in the 8th century in order to establish Buddhism in its tantric form since the earlier forms of Buddhism that had been uh, brought to Tibet were not really having the kind of impact um, that uh, was needed. And there's sort of great accounts of, of what was happening and what Padmasambhava did in order to bring about that uh, transformation of, of uh, uh, Tibetan culture and civilization through his own sort of tantric magic, if you will. Uh, and we, again, we see that this was a, Padmasambhava represented a very non, in, in his own right, a non-monastic, non-celibate tradition here in union with uh, Indian uh, princess uh, Mandarava, who her, became also a, a great, um, held to be also a Mahasiddha in her own right. Um, and many, many uh, very powerful traditions, particularly sort of medical tantras traditions connected with long life and longevity uh, uh, associated with her today. Uh, so we see in all of this, uh, as I mentioned, this veneration of the feminine principle, a transformation of early traditions of um, yogini worship, if you will, in India, uh, here on the left, in an 8th, 9th century temple from uh, Orissa uh, in India, which is sometimes held to be another alternate uh, location for Udiana. And then again, the wrathful form of, um, in, uh, in the Tibetan tradition of Troma, a kind of transformation of the uh, Hindu tantric deity Kali. And what we see, for example, in India, pri uh, already from the time in which the tantras were moving to Tibet, we see these yogini temples as circular uh, shrines, as places that were actually places in which tantric practices were enacted uh, communally. Uh, we see those in particular here in the three cases uh, of uh, temples in Orissa. Uh, and we see on the right, essentially the template for that, which is a mandala of Vajrayogini. Uh, a place again uh, where we can see even the niches as it were the 64 niches around the mandala template in the lower right being um, uh, represented architecture sorry uh, in the shrine above at Hirapur in in Odisha or Orissa uh, and again, here we see it more, more distinctly in another version of the same. Um, I'm very, very sorry. I have to take this. Hello? I, I, I have to call back. I'm, I'm, I'm doing an online talk. Can I call back? Very, very sorry about that interruption. Uh, uh, anyway, that hopefully won't happen again. Um, Anyway, what we see here is the, the gradual internalization of the, um, 
of these chakra points of these chakras were really circles and they referred as i said originally in these early shakta traditions um, in india as places for ritual practice and these were gradually internalized uh, both within the shaiva tradition as well as in the tibetan buddhist tantric buddhist tradition in india and we see that for example in this early um tibetan manuscript showing again what we can see here at the heart center with the seed syllable ah at the center. Uh, again, the ritual space becomes no longer an external place in which these uh, tantra practices were enacted um, through what we're called often um, um, gana chakras or sort of um, communal practices, but rather internal practices. And they become increasingly associated with the subtle body as we'll speak about more in a moment. Uh, and these, again, became more uh, extensively uh, represented in physical yogic practices that were ways in which those channel systems within the body and the chakra sites uh, within the central axis of the body could be activated. And we see that, for example, in this uh, more contemporary uh, tanka made by a Tibetan Lama, a Karpa Rinpoche, uh, showing the physical practices of yoga connected with the so-called uh, Bun Mother Tantras. So these were, according to the Bun tradition, uh, prior to the arrival of Buddhism in Tibet, there was held to be um, an already existent uh, tradition of Tantra, uh, in which the same practices that we see in Tantric Buddhism in India were already uh, evident. Um, so without going into the depths of this particular image, uh, we can see, for example, however, at the topmost, this image of Samantabhadra, uh, this uh, kind of primordial Buddha uh, in an erotic embrace, representing again the, the union of opposites, whether we understand those to be emptiness in appearance, form and emptiness, um, as well as the, the ecstatic dimension of um, that we see uh, as having been reintroduced into the Buddhist tradition as a result of the Buddhist tantric texts, but also very much evident within the Bun tradition, which claims to have been in existence uh, for centuries, uh, if not millennia before the, uh, uh, the tantras as they emerged in India. Although uh, just to problematize that, we really only have from the 11th century any written uh, documentation of the Bun, Bun mother tantras. So it's very, they did seem at least in a written form to arise simultaneously with the introduction of tantric Buddhism and tantric yoga um, from, from India. So again, uh, we see ways in which the, the, the Buddhist tradition in Tibet uh, began to represent these physical yogic practices here in a detail from the sixth Dalai Lama's private temple uh, called the Lukang in behind the Potala Palace in central Tibet. And this was a series of movements um, that, as you can see, culminate uh, in what we see in the lower left, the, the, the classic meditation pose of the seven pointed uh, posture of Vaidochana. Um, and we'll speak about these more in detail later, but what these represent essentially is a sequence of um, movements um, called trokor in Tibetan that um, were ways in which the, the uh, yogic body, if you will, the subtle body could be activated. In other words, the channels, the, the chakras, um, the inner winds were made pliant and therefore uh, prepared the body for deeper forms of, of, of meditation uh, in, in a state of stillness as we see uh, in the lower left-hand image. And again, looking just iconographically, we can see that the figure there is shown to be sort of radiating light. So the whole idea is that the physical practices were there in order to uh, create a foundation for a deepened experience of, um, of uh, meditative practice. Uh, we see this, this Lukong temple as which for those murals were from uh, itself is a mandala. Uh, uh, on a small little island behind the Potala Palace. And here we see a yogin practicing chud actually uh, on the steps of the Lukang temple. So I wanted to speak a little bit about how did the uh, tradition of um, 
Tibetan yoga actually come to the West and probably, and then after that to sort of go more into depth about what the fundamental principles and practices really are. Uh, but one of the earliest instances of which the so-called secret oral teachings in Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan yoga came was through uh, Alexander David Neal, uh, who was a great uh, it, uh, explorer, adventurous in the 1920s, who made multiple trips to Tibet and brought back some of the, the first uh, accounts of uh, some of, of the six yogas, for example, of Naropa that we'll speak about and which you've already heard about from Glenn Mullen. Uh, we also see that in the fall, in the same uh, decade, um, the anthropologist uh, Walter Evans Wentz, um, he also uh, made the first translations of some of the Tibetan yogic practices, uh, including the first translation of the Bardo Tudil, which was translated in English as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which of course is the, the, bardo, the practices of the bardo as an intermediary realm between one life and the next are the kind of culminating uh, practices of the sequence of the six yogas. And we'll speak about that also a little bit later. But again, uh, we see these, the 1920s as a time in which was between the first and the second world wars. It was a time in which the Western world was becoming increasingly open to uh, teachings from the East, from India, from Tibet, prior to, uh, in, in, in distinction from the 19th century, for example, when the, uh, a lot of the practices of, uh, from this part of the world were looked upon rather askance as being sort of necromancy. And we have some of the earliest accounts of Tantra were, were far less favorable. But in the 1920s, these began to be looked at with much more interest. And then another, and a decade later, we see with uh, Theos Bernard, uh, he was often referred to as the White Lama, was actually invited to Tibet in the 1930s in order to become essentially an emissary for, for the Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition in the West. And so this book, which is uh, subtitled Tibet Yoga and the American Religion and American Religious Life, uh, is a very interesting account of uh, Theos Bernard, who was, as you can see in the upper right, not only uh, deeply connected with the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but himself a great practitioner of Hatha Yoga, so phys physical yoga. And we see, for example, uh, in one of his books here, important postures of yoga in which he actually includes um, drawings uh, from a Tibetan manuscript, which he received in Tibet in the 1930s, uh, illustrating uh, Tibetan physical yoga, in, in, along with the Tibetan inscriptions describing it. So in one of his several books about the tradition, Penthouse of the Gods, in which he writes about his journeys to Tibet, he's also making this first link uh, really between the, the yogic traditions um, the, of, of physical uh, practices that we tend to associate with, of course, modern postural yoga and the inner practices of, of tantric Buddhism. So after uh, Theos Bernard, strangely, these practices uh, kind of went, um, became less evident because what we became, what we became exposed to, in fact, was more the monastic practices, the monastic traditions of Tibet um, after, in, after the diaspora from Tibet in the 19, uh, after 1959. But what I want to emphasize in this talk is really when we look back at the Frozen.
we've lost Ian again, but I'm sure he will rejoin us shortly. Life in the Bardo. Yes. <laughs> And Ian has rejoined us. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's really quite a wild storm raging outside and uh, it's playing havoc with uh, the internet at the moment, but let's um, try to resume where we were. I'll go back to the um, presentation and um, try to, and hopefully there won't be too many uh, uh, further disturbances. Let's see. So I was right here. And um, what I wanted to, to emphasize at this point was the, the revalorization of the physical body uh, within the uh, so-called uh, the Yogini uh, Tantra tradition associated most closely with the, with the 84 Mahasiddhas, who were both male and female practitioners who were specialists, if you will, in the the, the completion stage of the, uh, of the inner Vajrayana tradition. So here, Mahasiddha Saraha says, I've seen in my wanderings many temples and shrines, but none are as blissful as my own body. So what we see with that is this, this um, as I mentioned, a kind of revalorization, a recognition of the power and uh, potentiality of human embodiment. Uh, we see that, for example, in a... Um, uh, a yogini in, in Nepal uh, at the Vajra Yogini Shrine uh, using um, it, what we could really refer to as deity yoga, but not in a kind of passive form, but in a very enacted form uh, through ritual dance, uh, connecting with um, the, the Shaka Sambara Tantra in her case, and very connected, who was the consort of uh, Vajra Yogini being the consort of Shaka Sambara, as we see in this Buddhist uh, Tanka to the right. So we also see the Mahasiddha Virupa, for example, whose story is also very, very colorful. And again, in a modern iteration of, uh, of, a, of a female tantric deity on the left, uh, this idea of the physical body as a vehicle for increased um, capacities of the mind. And that's again symbolized as we see, for example, normally with Tara, with the eye in the hand. So this integration of, uh, of skillful means with, with penetrating wisdom. So here we see kind of a, a you could say, a, a contemporary reimagining of that link and essential link between, between our actions uh, being based upon um, primordial wisdom. We also see, for example, in an image here of another Mahasiddha uh, riding on the back of a tiger. All of these, of course, have great symbolic import um, and uh, with, a, with a rather diminutive yogini on the right. Uh, again, representing the idea that these are both outer and inner phenomena, but it's an awakening to, to human possibility through dynamic engagement with the sensory world rather than the rejection of it. So this is sort of represented in all aspects of Tantric Buddhist iconography. And the idea here being that within our own bodies, uh, we can actually discover our own Buddha nature. Uh, again, we see that in the detail from the, the Lukong murals of the three principal channels that we'll speak about in a minute of the, of the physical body, uh, which is also the subtle body and the Buddha uh, that emanates from the heart center. 
essentially representing not an external Buddha, um, but um, our own essential nature of, of awakened uh, wisdom, compassion, and ultimately omniscience. Interestingly, in this particular image of a primordial Buddha, Samandabhadra, shown very long-haired as a yogin, as opposed to an ascetic monk. Uh, all of this, of course, ties into the Tibetan uh, medical tradition as well. We see the five chakras um, along the central axis of the, uh, the physical body uh, as they intersect with known arteries and veins and channels um, within the physical anatomy. So there was this sort of interesting correlation and attempts to correlate within the medical tradition, the tantric physiology, if you will, and the actual... Um, veins um, veins and, and arteries that could be actually um, seen within within a body a human body so there was kind of an interface between the physical and the energetic and we see that again here in a more contemporary uh, version of that same uh, historical medical chart in Tibet on the left uh, and with a very early 11th century, um, diagram, a uh, meditation diagram of uh, the yogic body here in a female form representing the, the tantric deity Vajra Varahi, which we can identify because of the boar's head coming out from the top of her head, uh, and many, many different symbolic elements in this particular image of the, you could say, energetic body or the metaphysical, uh, the metaphysical body. And perhaps what's one of the things that I'll mention here, which I think is very interesting when we're looking at the way in which these different traditions developed across uh, cultures, um, we see in this very early image, uh, both burn elements uh, in the terms of the swastika that's held uh, in, her, in her left hand. Uh, we also see that particular image of associated with Vajrayogini of the two intersecting triangles, sort of a pentagram, um, um, uh, at the heart center. And we also see very distinctly kind of three uh, serpent forms uncoiling from the, the lower pelvic cavity uh, in red, white, and a kind of golden serpent. So these are, of course, we tend, we associate with Hindu Tantra in the sense of the so-called Kundalini energy, the serpent power, as it's often been referred to, that basically awakens our, this primordial consciousness and energy within the subtle, the subtle body. But here we see it in a in a, in a distinctly Tibetan Buddhist uh, form. We also see uh, below that uh, an image of a bow um, at the, in the pelvic uh, cavity, the pe pelvic cradle. And this becomes relevant uh, when, we, when we'll explore a little bit more about the practices that lie, how does one actually awaken and activate this particular um, energy pattern, if you will. And often that is described as the within the pel within the pelvic cavity, dr the drawing of a bow, sort of creating a kind of inner tension in there that, when released, kind of uh, shoots up through um, the the central channel, and awakens these dormant capacities of the mind body. We see that um, very distinctly in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, associating that um, inner energy uh, that I mentioned was in the in the Hindu tradition referred to as Kundalini. Sometimes in the early um, Buddhist tantras in India it was refers to as Chandali. Chandali literally the fire goddess and the fire and Chandali was translated in Tibetan as Tumo literally meaning the, the fierce feminine, the fierce female, the fierce goddess uh, but very much associated with this kind of idea of blazing. So all of the six yoga, uh, the six uh, yoga practices um, connected with Naropa, Tilopa, uh, Niguma, and and the Yutok tradition, as we'll speak about later, were connected with initiation into the mandala of Vajrayogini, and we see her in her anthropomorphic form on the left, and again on the right, uh, showing her as essentially representing this the 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 fire goddess, uh, if you will, or this, this primordial feminine power uh, associated actually with the solar energy in the pelvic cavity that awakens and melts the, the male principle or lunar principle in this case at the crown of the head. Um, we'll speak about that a bit more in a while as well. So again, in two details that we see from the Lukong murals that were created at the end of the 17th century to as a kind of illustrated guide 
of the path to enlightenment for the sixth Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lamas after him, we sort of see two different approaches that could be taken uh, towards the awakening of one's own Buddha nature um, in the sense that all beings as were as are described um, are, are Buddhas, uh, except we are that nature is hidden to us because of the kind of obscure the obstacles that obscure our awareness of that. What we see on the left in the kind of Dzogchen tradition is the pure contemplative approach in which these kinds of obstacles to our um, perfected awareness are gradually dissolved um, through the practice in Dzogchen of, of trikcha, of cutting through uh, those the, the ways in which thoughts and emotions obstruct that awareness. What we see on the right is a kind of condensed image that combines both the, the inner fire practices, the tumo practice, along with the poa practice of ejection of consciousness, so that one's actually consciousness transcends the physical body ultimately to a Buddha field, as we see represented in the upper left of the upper of the uh, image on the right, bypassing the bardo or this kind of intermediary realm uh, between one life and the next, um, and uh, therefore attaining a state of of, uh, of a pure land, if you will. Uh, in which enlightenment can be more easily achieved. So again, we see on the right the the, the three core channels associated with the, the practice of Tumo in particular, and which also becomes the, the um, central axis of the body, which is used in POA in, or, in order to sort of transfer consciousness outside the body into um, another dimension. In all of these, we see, for example, in a, in a manuscript connected with the Kala Chakra Tantra, which was the latest, the last of the great um, Buddhist Tantras to emerge in India um, from the 11th century. So sort of starting with the Guya Samaja Tantra, the Hevajra, the Chakra Samvara, and the Kala Chakra, which is very much a syncretic tradition that drew from the pre-existing Tantras that had emerged and drew very overtly as well on the, contempor on the contemporaneous Shaiva traditions. And here we again see this, this great example of how these chakras or, or energy plexuses within the central axis of the physical body were essentially correlates of the of a macrocosma cosm and the outer world. So basically the practice being how to use the human body as a vehicle for transcending our kind of um, uh, lesser ways in, of self-definition in order to attain the self-transcendent state in which there was no actual division between outer, inner, secret as it was described in the tradition or essentially microcosm and ma macrocosm the body and the universe as a whole so this is interesting when we look at the origins of physical yogic practice um, in uh, in tantric buddhism so we actually see in a commentary the vimala prabha uh, the treatise of light on the kala chakra tantra from the the 11th century which describes for the first time Hatha yoga within a tantric Buddhist tradition. So I'll try to read that. Some of it's hidden from my screen. Uh, so you'll have to sort of, where I sort of make a gap, you'll have to fill in if you can see it. But basically it says now Hatha yoga is explained. In this system, meaning the Kala chakra system, when the undying moment does not arise because the breath is unrestrained, uh, even when the, it's hidden to me, is seen by means of withdrawal, pratyahara, and the other auxiliaries of dhyana, pranayama, dharana, anusmriti, and samadhi, then having fully, um, again hidden, hathena, made, having forcefully uh, made the breath flow into the central channel um, uh, through the, the nada, which is about to be explained, the yogi should attain the undying moment of non-vibration through restraining the drops of the bodhicitta, the semen, in the vajra, in the penis, when it is in the lotus of the um, of the the bhaga, of the vagina of the vagina. This is hatha yoga. So this is just it's a very interesting um, textually based account of hatha yoga, which we tend to associate now, and of course in gyms and fitness centers across the world as if just physical yoga. But when we see one of its first, where it first is, it first appears as a, as a defined tradition, it's very much within the Kala Chakra Tantra as a practice involving sexual yoga 
and as a, as a physical means for causing the subtle energies, subtle substances of the body uh, to be circulated uh, within this central, um, within the, the, the sort of central anatomy, if you want to call it that, into the, um, so in other words, drawing them away from the pranic winds associated with the two side channels into the, the central mahanadi. Uh, so again, much to be said about it, but I think it was, it's important to sort of bring this out because it helps to explain, you know, a lot of the confusion of, uh, within Tantra, which uh, we know is in the West is often as, is, is reductively defined as a, as a kind of, um, sacred eroticism. Whereas of course that element is part of it. It was far much, much more than that. Um, but certainly that element is, is there. Uh, and so as a result, we see a lot of the physical yogas, which were also enumerated uh, and described extensively in the Kala Chakra Tantra, were used for, in order to sort of activate this, this inner Vajra anatomy, if you want to refer to that, a metaphysical anatomy within the physical uh, body. We see different examples of that, for example, in, even in the Dzogchen tradition, um, in which uh, the physical body is activated um, uh, uh, so as to attain the visionary um, kind of uh, associated again, finally with three kind of held asanas uh, that you see in the lower right of the, the lion, the, the elephant and the rishi, uh, in which the flow of energy through the body after having can, uh, performed the other more extensive physical yogas allows for a kind of visionary appearances uh, to arise uh, within one's mind stream. Uh, but we see also within other uh, manuscripts in Tibet, um, examples of how physical yoga uh, can be used in order to access uh, dimensions of consciousness and awareness that are otherwise often uh, hidden because of the obscuring of the energy flows within the subtle body. Here in a rather beautiful manuscript from the 18th century, um, show, uh, with showing the 32 movements connected with the Hevajra Tantra, for example, uh, very much based upon the activation of Tumo. Uh, we also see a tradition of uh, Yutok Yuntin Gombo here in a, in a contemporary image, but very distinctive. Uh, he was uh, in the uh, 12th century associated with the codification of the four medical tantras, which are the basis for the medical tradition in Tibet. But he also developed uh, a kind of synthetic, uh, in the sense of the grand synthesis of the tantric Buddhist path, for, uh, based upon eight journeys that he made at that time uh, to India, really at the, the culmination and almost at the end of the tantric Buddhism in India, which largely just disappeared from the 13th century onward. Uh, but in the Yutok Nintik, the heart essence of Yutok, um, what he did was to kind of describe a medicalized uh, approach uh, to inner Vajrayana practice that was both a, a form of self-healing as well as an activation of, of our innermost potential. So I think um, his teachings are particularly interesting and relevant in our current age when we tend to look for medical evidence that what we do has, has efficacy. Uh, so again, something we, we can speak about more at length later. Uh, but going back to that uh, 17th century manuscript, uh, we again see examples of uh, postures such as the Mayuri Asana or the peacock pose that we tend to associate with a modern Hatha Yoga, a very difficult pose, not one you see typically done, but certainly uh, a, tr a practice that's still kept alive by, by practitioners in the Himalayan world um, who were practicing uh, these inner uh, trulkor, as they were called, literally the trulkor is translated sometimes as magical movements or the magical wheel, um, but essentially representing the Hatha Yoga physical practices within the Tantric Buddhist tradition. But we really can see that uh, this is not just an innovation in Tibet, uh, nor even in the Vajrayana tradition in India. We actually look back to some of the earliest teachings of the Buddha, and he referred to the importance of physical training. Uh, here we see in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutra, if the body is not mastered, the mind cannot be mastered. If the body is mastered, mind is mastered. So here, and then on the left, we see Jalandhara, another Mahasiddha in a rather complex um, 
hatha yoga pose, if you will. So again, we see that the idea of um, the body as a vehicle for attaining Buddha nature, attaining enlightenment is something that really goes back to the origins of the Buddhist tradition, but certainly came to its full fruition in the tantric Buddhist uh, yogic practices that we see here as preliminary to the, the movements that are preliminary to, and in a certain sense, help to bring about that, that profound stillness through which our own innermost nature is actually discovered within. Um, and again, we can see examples of the profoundly uh, dynamic aspects of the, uh, of the, the way in which these tantric Buddhist physical practices were taken in the Himalayan world here by a yogi in Bhutan uh, who didn't want to be recognized, therefore wearing a mask of Milarepa, um, but performing what's called in the Tibetan tradition Bep or the yogic falls. So these were in the practice, while doing the, the yogic practices that you saw earlier, these were often punctuated by these so-called Beps or the Vajra falls in which you with only with a perfectly held um, kumbhaka or vase breath so that you protect your spine, you would land on a mat such as you see here in order to in induce a kind of uh, psychophysical shock within the organism that would drive the karmic winds as they were described from the side channels into the central core of the body and bring about a non-conceptual state of awareness. So this is again, one of the reasons why some of these kind of practices might you know, have been kept hidden or secret because if you practice this on your own without proper guidance and training, you can really injure yourself. But interestingly, for example, in the Yutok tradition uh, prior, this is from the Naropa tradition, actually this is from the Loncha Nintik tradition, 17th century. But if we look back to the early more medical ways in which Yutok Nintik, for example, explicates these practices, these yogic falls are done in a, in a less intensive way in which the possibility of hurting oneself is much is really not there. So those again, I think sometimes we can see that some of the earlier practices were actually perhaps uh, more applicable you know, in our contemporary lives and some of the more uh, elaborated ones or as they became more elaborated, elaborated historically. But again, here we see this yogi again, uh, performing this uh, the, uh, uh, sort of a flying bep as it were. Uh, and again, not something that is really that achievable for many of us. <laughs> and here again, uh, um, Sita Rinpoche in Bhutan, in, uh, in Bumtang, performing uh, some of these yogic baps or yogic falls uh, in, a, in a temple. And again, these were ways in which the, you could use the physical body in order to change the circuitry of the flows of energy within the physical body in order to attain um, a, a state of profound uh, inner awareness connected ultimately with a state of stillness. So this idea of movement and stillness, how they actually complemented each other within the inner tantric tradition you know, is quite important. And also just something to point out here, again, the kind of ritual, um, the, the, the skirt, this unrock that the, the yogi here is wearing uh, with the red band, the, the green representing air, the blue space, the red, the fire, the white, the, the, um, the white element within the body. All of these had a symbolic meaning. And the same way that you see the skirting at the upper top of the image around the shrine, this was the same way in which as, as, as uh, Siddha Rinpoche described it, you know, the body itself becomes the temple. So the point, the, the point of practicing with the Anrak is to actually uh, show that we're not doing this just as a physical practice. We're doing this, we're taking the body as a temple, as a shrine, the way Saraha indicated it, as a body of bliss, um, but a bliss not just for hedonic purposes, but as a bliss that transcends the, the, the realm uh, and uh, duality of desire in order to be able to attain a state of direct cognition of the luminous emptiness, which is our essential nature. So bliss in this sense is a, is a path to enlightenment. It's not in any way an aim in and of itself. Again, here we see that same yogic movement and sequence above the, what's called the, uh, you know, the Vajra Bep, um, uh, which is actually, you know, you start from a standing position on your toes and then you 
essentially go into full lotus ideally uh, in the air and then land again on on the on the mat. But again, if it's not done perfectly, it can you can easily injure yourself. But here it was done by a yogi who said, "Oh, in my youth, I I could have hit the ceiling," uh, and he hadn't done it in years. But obviously, still extremely impressive uh, here in his late forties, I think he was when he was doing this. And again, we see a, a, a Tibetan manuscript uh, showing how at the end of this kind of sequence of physical movements, um, you could also press upon uh, these points at the, the carotid arteries at the side, inside the neck, um, in order to bring about this uh, movement of the, the karmic winds into the central channel. Uh, again, a very a practice that I think in the, the, as I saw in the introduction to your module, uh, Tantra is often described as a perilous or hazardous uh, path to enlightenment, and indeed it's so. And the Dalai Lama, for example, when he uh, commented on that particular practice of what's often called the Vajra wave, and you do that with a very specifically held breath, which again is kind of uh, indicated symbolically in the line drawing, just showing the vase uh, at the, at the, in the, at the um, base of the abdomen and the pelvic, pelvic cavity. If it's not done, you, you induce a state of almost fight or flight, but by remaining completely at ease and calm uh, in that moment, actually a, a, new, a new reality, a new state of consciousness emerges. But again, uh, these are practices to be undertaken with close supervision. Um, now, I don't know how it appears on your screen, but in mine, unfortunately, this is rather hidden. Um, but um, uh, this is, to, so when we think about the six yogas and Glenn Mullen, I know has already spoken about it, but I just wanted to kind of uh, essentialize some of what those practices represent and why they were sort of fundamental within the, uh, the inner tantric tradition of, uh, or what we could really call the completion phase of the uh, of, of Vajrayana Buddhism. So the, the, the creation phase referring to the conjuring of oneself as a deity, the reimagining of reality as a, as a mandala of enlightened beings, really a full engagement with the mind uh, and, and imagination as a way of transforming our ordinary human experience. But what happens with the, the six yogas is all of those inner, those, the, the, the imagination is turned inward. The mandala becomes the body itself. And the practices of the six yogas, starting with tumul, uh, become the means for bringing the so-called karmic winds from the side channels. And those two side channels, of course, interconnecting with all the other channels within the body. So again, uh, kind of symbolic of uh, bringing them to a unified state. And again, I'm going to have to sort of improvise because I can't see the fully what's written, um, but from memory, the yogic body is a network of energy channels, uh, coarse and subtle, intersecting the energy fields or the chakras should be brought under control. So this is the fundamental basis for the six yogas. The method begins with the physical exercises, which we've seen, the trokor. The energy winds are drawn inward. They're expanded, retained, and, dis and uh, dispersed. Um, there are two side channels, the central channel, the avaduti, and the four chakras. Flames rise from the chandali fire at the navel. A stream of nectar drips down from the syllable hum at the crown, invoking the four joys. So this is essentially the whole basis for, as Tilopa described it to Naropa, uh, in the 11th century for the, the six yogas as a whole. But what we really see is a core practice that we see also within the Shaiva tradition. Um, we see it in an early text uh, called the Amrita Siddhi, the perfection of nectar. And what it's representing is this idea of the, um, you could really say kind of on an anatomical level, the, the whole, what would be called today, the, the hypo, um, you know, the gonadal um, hypothalamic axis of the body from the enteric nervous system at the base of the, of the human body to the, you know, to the brain at the top. And it's this idea of bringing about a kind of dynamic uh, interaction between these two centers of, of awareness consciousness uh, into a new uh, uh, stream of experience, if you will, uh, which is described metaphorically as this, this descent of the nectar, this idea in which the body becomes filled with bliss, uh, which activates the so-called four joys, 
or the, the four blisses, as they're also described in the, in the tantric Buddhist tradition. And these four blisses, the four joys, essentially become the tantric equivalent of the four jhanas, or the four states of meditative absorption that we see in, the, um, in, the er in early Buddhism, for example. And Theravada Buddhism speaks about the four jhanas as states of increasing meditative absorption, which are in their own right, uh, associated with states of kind of, uh, of, of bliss and therefore bliss being already that which overturns desire and therefore which only in, brings about a state of, of samadhi, inner absorption. But in Tantra, they're overtly described as states of bliss. Uh, again, we see the ways in which these practices were are performed. Um, as we've talked about, often these were considered secret and yet here we actually see images of the 16th Karmapa, uh, practicing um, uh, using the meditation belt to stabilize the posture uh, and using his his arms to uh, which you can see pressing at the Vajra gates at the upper uh, ends of the um, between the thighs and the groin in order to concentrate energy into the base of the central channel below six four finger widths beneath the navel and using the, the, the arms uh, stretched to the side, uh, along the side of the body in the image to the left in order to bring the karmic winds uh, into the central channel. So that's symbolically what's being represented. So in that then becomes here again in a, in a visual, in a painted image of uh, one of the postures for Tumo, Chandali, the inner fire blazes upwards from the navel. She incinerates the five Buddhas. Ham is burnt and the moon at the crown melts. So this is from the Hevajra Tantra, one of the earliest Buddhist Tantras to describe the practice of Tumo, or as it's literally referred to in that text in its Sanskrit form as Chandali. Um, so this is important. What does it mean by it's incinerating the five Buddhas? So again, in the completion stage, what you're doing is to some degree, you're undoing, you're reversing, you're you're um, dissolving, which is really more of what's happening. The, the outer constructed reality associated with visualization and creative imagination or active imagination within the creation phase. And through the inner experience of those mental conceptions, ultimately uh, dissolving into a felt experience of, of bliss. That's what the symbol means of hum being burnt, melted at the crown and uh, dissolving within the physical body. We can actually see earlier antecedents prior to the Buddhist tradition, even in the Maitri Upanishad, uh, in which this idea of inner fire is emphasized. So for example, in this early Upanishad, like a lamp stirred by a subtle breeze, the one who dwells among the gods blazes up. The one who knows this blazing knows unity and duality. That one comes to a single abode. So this is important, not just in the sense of showing early, you could say antecedents of what the Tumo practice, but this idea of knowing unity and duality, I think is very important. Why do we speak of, we don't just speak of oneness, we speak of non-duality, in other words, very, very important in the tantric Buddhist tradition. You know, this isn't just becoming just one, you know, kind of great uh, dissolution into a single um, uh, dimension. It's really about the dy dynamism that exists in which we're able to work with form and emptiness, emptiness and form as a dynamic, the dynamic polarities of existence. And that's really where you could say the dance of, of, of Tantra occurs uh, so that we know both. Uh, we're not, it's not about abandoning one for the other, but the single abode is the place where that, that uh, as it's called the blazing and the melting, the blazing and the dripping of, tundra, of Tumo occurs and in which we can go into these inner states uh, and yet at the same time engage dynamically in, in the outer world. So Milarepa in the 11th century, who inherited the, the, the tradition of the six yogas from his teacher Marpa, who in turn had received it from uh, Naropa in India. These six yogas are the culminating instructions of the whispered lineage. No other path of method can be found that is superior to these. So again, referring to why uh, these are really at the center of the, of the inner tantric path, uh, why they were actually the methods that brought Yeshitsogyal, for example, uh, to enlightenment in the eighth century, uh, the first Tibetan supposedly to have achieved enlightenment through uh, the practices of, um, uh, of Tumo in particular. And again, here, just to again, emphasize the importance of Tumo, 
when the inner fire Tumo blazed, this is again from a song of Milarepa so called Song of the Yogin's Joy in the 11th century. When the inner fire Tumo blazes, the whole body fills with bliss. Uh, when the pranic currents of the Pingala, the Roma, the solar force and the Kyangma, the lunar force enter the middle of Nadi, the central channel in the upper chakras through the downward flow of illuminated, again, it's slightly hidden on my screen, so I'm improvising awareness. Bliss arises in the lower centers due to all penetrating creative energy. Bliss arises in the heart center when compassion dwells up um, through the, again, hidden, red and white currents of sublimated lunar and solar forces. Bliss arises when the, when the body is pervaded by boundless contentment. This is the sixfold joy of the yogin. So what we're speaking about here really is the same thing that we saw earlier, which is that the idea that these practices bring about states of subtle absorption that are not just states of meditative learning, they are states that are associated with what we can call bliss. And why bliss is emphasized so much, or ananda, as it originally would have been called in, uh, in the Sanskrit tradition, or importantly in the Tibetan translation, uh, not just dewa, but detong. So detong literally meaning bliss and emptiness. Bliss is never uh, exists apart from, from emptiness. And it's that state of bliss and emptiness that brings about the transcendence of our, of our normal samsara consciousness in which we identify with our thoughts, emotions, desires. Whereas bliss is by nature non-dual because it no longer has an object. It's already a state of completion. So bliss in that sense is that which overturns the very samsara uh, situation and brings about uh, the state of nirvana, which is literally in Sanskrit, the, the, the putting out of the fire, uh, or it's the self-existing fire. Uh, but in other words, it's no longer based upon an outer and inner uh, duality. But um, again, here we can see that uh, in another instant, another summary of the five stages in this case uh, by the Nag Mahasiddha Nagabodhi. Um, and um, the, the, by means of the inner heat, great bliss arises at the force of the mind. The meaning of this passage is that one engages in the yogas of energy control, such as the Vajra breath repetition, and that's something we can speak about at the end, and so forth, as taught in the Guya Samaja Tantra and other such systems, until eventually the experience of the clear light consciousness known as final mind isolation is induced. This achievement depends on one first achieving proficiency in the inner heat yoga, as taught in the He Vajra and Chakra Samvara systems, by means of which one induces the four blisses. And this induces the experience of semblant clear light consciousness that arises together with the inner bliss. So again, here we see a, a summary of what we've seen in the other descriptions of essentially the core practice, if you will, of um, Tibetan Tantric yoga, which is centered around the, the activation of this this inner fire, which is inseparable from a state of um, bliss awareness, which um, essentially incinerates the, uh, if you will, the samsaric kind of mind, which tends to uh, kind of, as we know, can circulate between thoughts and, and emotions and sort of bring us into to the cycle, if we will, of discontent. That is one possible translation of what samsara or worldly existence can refer to as opposed to nirvana, which is the, the, the extinguishing of those kind of uh, divisive um, energies that, that uh, occlude, uh, in other words, or eclipse that awareness of ourselves as, as, as Buddhas um, or as, as embodying Buddha mind. Um, and again, all of this is based in its, at its center on the, the idea that within our own physical bodies is an energetic spectrum uh, that is normally we don't tend to associate uh, with, but the whole point of tantric Buddhist yoga is to activate and become increasingly aware of um, the centers of energy and the circulation of energy within the body, which is not just about a kind of preoccupation with uh, energy flows within our own central body, but they are by, in essence, self-transcendent states. Because by identifying with this flow of energy within our physical bodies, we're already engaged in an experience of our being, which in a way already transcends um, thoughts, emotions, um, 
And not that those are not things that we can work with skillfully, but the point of these activation of the subtle energy system is to experience, you could say, a transpersonal dimension of human embodiment um, that often goes, is often, un, that we're often unaware of. And again, we see an example of a Tibetan yogi uh, activating that, that sort of core um, uh, energy pattern as we see it depicted on, on the left in a contemporary image. And um, the, with the, the blue central channel and the, the white, in this case, the a white channel on the, on the right-hand side of the body and the, the red on the left. Now there are other systems, for example, in the Kala Chakra tradition where that's reversed. For example, you'll have the red uh, on the right and the white on the left. So the point being in all of these practices that one works within the, the constructs of that particular Tantra, how it's described, um, but there's not, it's really because we're working in that initial phase with creative imagination. Uh, what's important Mr. Repre is that it essentially it's a map for an inner experience that might have a lot of variation. And so that there's not always direct correlation between, between the traditions, but what's represented here, for example, as, a, as a, an example of how Tumo is practiced, um, we can see that same hum syllable at the upper, at the crown chakra, inverted and melting. And I know with Tashi Maddox, for example, you were introduced to the Bija mantras. Mantras essentially referring to the vibratory energies that you know, we experience within our body, speech, and mind, and which by becoming conscious of and activating, um, become part of a living awareness that is often somehow uh, you know, not present within us. And then we also see at the base of this central channel, uh, this flame uh, depicted as the, the awe stroke, as it's often described. Uh, it can be for the Utok Nintik tradition, for example, because it was a, a tradition created for Tibetan medical practitioners. Very interestingly, you, instead of in place of the the so-called inverted awe stroke uh, sa says to visualize a burning hot copper needle, such as you'd use in acupuncture. Uh, so something that again was for part of their their own experience, and what would be melting at the top was not necessarily a, 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 a was actually a bead of mercury, uh, again, which was used as a as a very powerful medicine in Tibetan uh, medical tradition. Once the mercury was purified of its toxic elements, it was a it, uh, represented movement and um, a mobilizing uh, quality that could be combined with other substances in order to bring about um, a powerful states of healing and illumination. So what we see here, again, depicted in this contemporary image is this idea of the, the bringing the side, the, uh, here the white and the red channels representing in some respects, the, the male and the female elements. So the white element, the red element, the red element associated with the feminine, the white with the male, the masculine. Uh, but the point being to bring those energies into the central transpersonal axis of our own physical bodies uh, in order to bring about a, a state of awareness uh, that transcends our ordinary sense of who and what we are. So this was really the essence of uh, Tumo, of Chandali. Um, and there were two postures uh, associated uh, with it, most typically. The one we saw was with the the Vajra fists uh, pressing down at the point between the, gro the groin and the upper thighs. And then the, po uh, the posture that we see here on the left was, uh, was called the three-pointed stove posture, which Milarepa ultimately adopted, um, in which uh, the posture he said could be held more easily for more extended periods of time. And you would do it after the fire was ignited. So this was a posture you would remain in once you kind of activated it using the more forceful method of pressing the fists into the, the wind point at the, the wind gate, as it was also referred to at the upper thighs. And again, uh, we see on the right, the way that's activated with the three channels. And again, the hum syllable representing the lunar principle associated with the male in this case being melted at the top of the head and ultimately uh, bringing about this uh, state of primordial awareness, primordial consciousness symbolized by the syllable ah, that we know from the Dzogchen tradition and ultimately allowing a uh, kind of transference of consciousness uh, beyond the physical body uh, in the practice of POA. So as the Dalai Lama himself uh, commented on that image to the right, he said, well, this really does seem to represent the beginning 
and the end of the six yoga system, both the Tumul as well as the Poa. Uh, so we, we can speak about, I'm sure Glenn Mullen illuminated uh, that whole, you know, what, the, what lies between, but I'll also be doing that in a moment as well. Uh, so here again, we see the posture of Tumo on the right, the classic posture with the, the, uh, the ends of the, of the hands pressing into the wind gates. Um, the yogi on the left in Dergi in Eastern Tibet, when he was demonstrating this, kind of apologized. He said, well, actually, we're supposed to do this practice naked, as we can see, actually, with the yogis uh, on the right, who are sort of just there almost in, in their anraks. But under the circumstances in which that image was taken years ago, uh, this was just to demonstrate he, as a, as a wandering uh, yogin, um, in which Tuma was his primary practice. We see Azam uh, Pelo Rinpoche on the upper right, also uh, contemporary Lama practicing Tuma. But again, as I mentioned earlier, this was the practice associated with uh, the Yeshi Sogyo, in which she used in her own path. Uh, to become the first enlightened um, uh, being in Tibet, according to the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, as a direct disciple and uh, partner of, of Padmasambhava. We see her in a painted image as well as in a, in a more contemporary uh, uh, line drawing, showing her in the classic uh, Tumo posture. And this again, her cave uh, in central Tibet in which she practiced Tumo. Uh, so Yeshe Sogyal, uh, because I want to really want to emphasize and what my book also tries to emphasize is the kind of the hidden voices, if you will, of the female, uh, tradition, uh, of tantric Buddhism. If we really look back, for example, even at the, of the history of the six yogas, we tend to think, oh, they're the six yogas of Naropa. But in fact, they were the six yogas that Tilopa taught to Naropa. But where did actually Tilopa receive them from? And as we hear from him, well, there were two versions, one of which he received them directly, from Vajradhara, the primordial Buddha, but another version says he received them from a yogini. So, but we don't really hear much more about that yogini, but we do hear about Niguma, who was a contemporary of Naropa, who had her own system of the six yogas. We also, as I mentioned, there was also another system of the six yogas connected with Yutok, the founder of the Tibetan medical tradition. And it's very clear in his biography that from his eight trips to, to India, he received most of his teachings, both on medicine as well as on yoga from female yoginis. But again, their voices have been somewhat marginalized and we don't hear much about them. Why this image here is important is that this is a temple, the, the Sengipuk, the lion's cave in Bhutan near the famous tiger's nest. And this is the place where Yeshitsogyo came after attaining, uh, practicing Tumo. She practiced here with her consort, uh, Atsade Tsale, uh, who Padmasambhava had directed her to in Nepal, uh, to practice Karma Mudra. Um, so this goes to probably one of the more controversial aspects of Tantra, uh, going back to the words of Saraha, for example, the great Mahasmuda, uh, Mahasiddha, who said that without uh, Karma Mudra, there's no Mahamudra. So Mahamudra referring to essentially the great coalescence, enlightenment, um, Dzogchen, the great perfection, uh, as we understand it in the, the early traditions of Tantric Buddhism, um, and Karma Mudra referring to, to practice with a consort in which the practice of, the, uh, of inner fire, the blazing and the melting can be achieved uh, more, more uh, can be, let's say, um, accelerated. So we see that, for example, in the iconography of Padmasambhava himself in union with Mandarava, the Indian princess. We see it in an image of uh, Yogambara on the right, a tantric Buddhist deity, uh, again, representing, uh, on the one hand, an inner process of integration of opposites, uh, the male and female principles as they are understood in the monastic tradition to represent the polarities of wisdom and compassion. But we also know when we really look more from a historical point of view of the origins of the tantric yogas, we, we understand that there, there really was a partnered practice that has tend to be kind of sidelined due to kind of the rise of monasticism in Tibet. And again, we can see it pretty graphically uh, within the iconographical tradition itself. Here, Vajra, uh, He Vajra in union with Nairatma, selflessness. So again, we can interpret that on the one hand uh, as an inner process in which one becomes united with one's own transpersonal 
empty nature um, through the practice of, of the, the tantras. Um, but on another level, we can also understand it as something that we can bring into our lives in our interpersonal relationships, uh, in which that kind of divine vision of not just arising ourselves as deities and as Buddhas, but in which we can actually facilitate that um, in the recognition of all beings uh, as Buddhas and Dakas and Dakinis, if you will. And again, the image on the right uh, uh, signifying, again, the practice of the Karma Mudra, practice the union, uh, sexual union, and the, you can see the kind of symbolic fire uh, arising. So this was seen as a way of uh, kind of accelerating, activating, and intensifying the practice of, um, of tumor or inner fire. Again, not something that was required. It was one of the kind of auxiliary uh, of the six yogas, um, but it was, it is believed uh, to be something that in the right context can, can be a skillful means or taplam as it's called in Tibetan on the path to enlightenment. So there's also dream yoga. Um, we, we also saw, we'll go back for a moment uh, because we've seen you know, this is just in a short sort of uh, recapitulation of the six yogas. We see that after the, the practice, the waking practices of the illusory body, in other words, visualizing the body as a hollow body without its organs, without the liver, or the heart, and all of that, but just as a, as a network of, of, um, of uh, energy flows, which is the basis and foundation for the practice of tumo, which is the, the yoga of inner fire, how that can be accelerated through the practice of karma mudra, the, the consort practices, uh, bringing about that state of clear light, uh, which again, sort of just represented symbolically at the upper right, uh, but as a clear light uh, of, of awareness that is present uh, within all states of waking, dreaming, sleeping, and dying. And that ultimately is the goal of uh, the Tantric Buddhist path and the six yogas in particular. We bring that clear light awareness uh, from our waking state into our dreaming, into our sleep and dreaming state. Um, so for example, we also know that in the six yogas, there's also the practice of dream yoga. So we become lucid in the same way we attempt to become lucid while living, we become lucid while dreaming. So here a yogini representing symbolically uh, the posture in which, uh, one of the postures which can be used for uh, bringing about the a state of lucidity while dreaming and so that consciousness can be experienced outside um, of our, um, you could say normal waking state. Uh, and a, 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 in the image on the left representing the way uh, a visualization that we won't go into just given the interests of time and Glenn Mullen may have actually brought out a chain of Oz that you actually visualize between the heart, the throat and the upper chakras in order to facilitate uh, the entry into lucid awareness uh, while in the state of, of dreaming. And all of this about is about really bringing a state of, of lucidity into all aspects of our existence. And again, here we see that depicted uh, where the five chakras, for example, are no longer elaborated as they are um, in some of the earlier images we saw. They're actually just pure states of luminosity and awareness along the central axis of the body, both in the center from the heart and then above the, above the head in a kind of uh, luminous tigle, uh, a five colored light, and then on five chakras on the right of the yogi. And then a figure on the left, kind of gazing at uh, what was called the Vajra chain. These are advanced practices in Dzogchen in which um, whether lying or standing or whatever the postures and the practices may be about bringing a state of inner illumination into the human condition. And this is really what all of the, the six yogas are about. Um, we see, for example, here about the, in the Dzogchen uh, tradition, for example, the activation of the heart center and the connection of between the subtle channels between the heart and the eyes. And by activating that channel, these kind of visionary appearances arise. But of course, the visionary appearance, appearances themselves are not what's important. It's, as we know from the Dzogchen point of view, it's about looking who is the one who is perceiving these these uh, these appar these appearances, uh, and this is really what brings us into the awakened state. Um, and so the awakened state, you know, this culminates uh, in the Dzogchen, uh, the great perfection stage in the in the, the rainbow body, the dissolution of the physical body into into rainbow light at the end of one's lifespan. Um, 
I'm going to skip over that just because I see that there are some concerns with the interests of time here. Um, but this was for those who can see it, and if it's not hidden, uh, the Mahasiddha Tilopa kind of summarized the uh, the whole essence of the six yogas as going really beyond the kind of contrivances even of the practices of waking, dreaming, uh, sleeping, and dying. Um, and he he essentialized it. And again, because I can't, it's hidden by my screen. I, but I'll again try to paraphrase from memory. Let go of what is past. Let go of what may come. Let go of what is happening now. Don't try to figure anything out. Don't try to make anything happen. Relax right now and rest in the essential nature of the mind. So this was essentially even Mahasiddha's Talopa's takeaway from the six yogas. It was really about just uh, transcending as the ultimate uh, completion stage, uh, all of our uh, contrived conceptual approaches towards uh, the realization of, of our own Buddha nature and just recognizing that it's, it's ever present. I, I won't end there, however. I want to speak a little bit more in the, in the remaining 10 minutes or so, just about other ways in Dzogchen um, you, we activate um, this primordial stream of consciousness, if you will, which can symbolically represent it here in the waterfall. This is a practice of the practice of the five elements of earth, water, fire, air, and space, and which one can use in this case, the element of water in order to go beyond our normal state of identification with thoughts and emotions into a transcendent state and a state of flow. We see it depicted in a detail from the, the Dalai Lama, six Dalai Lama's uh, meditation chamber on the left and a contemporary practitioner on the right. And again, their, their text describing how one uses the sound of water uh, and nature and sounds of nature, not just with water, but with other elements in order to transcend our ordinary sense of who and what we are. Also in Dzogchen, for those of you who are familiar with it, which is sort of the final culmination of the inner tantric uh, tradition, often associated purely with a, just the recognition of the inseparability of the perceiver, the perceived, the act of perception, a very, very ultimate um, uh, state of which old practices prior to it are dissolved into just primary awareness. But we also see within the tradition actually a very, uh, very much an engagement in its preliminary practices with physical yoga. And so, for example, in the preliminary practices, the nundro for, for Dzogchen traditionally started with a, what was called the Vajra posture that we see depicted here, uh, the figure um, on the right, uh, or, uh, sorry, in the right of the image to the left, to the right. Uh, and let's see, I think there's a better image coming up. Yeah, here, you can see it better. Uh, the yogi on the right, uh, in which the body itself takes the posture of a, of a Vajra. And there's a visualization that goes along with it. And this is, again, a static isometric posture, which you hold while visualizing yourself as a Vajra in order to kind of go beyond your physical limits, as well as your mental and creative and imaginative limits. And this posture is to be held for as long as possible until the body just can't hold it. And then you collapse and then you stand up again until you're literally in the preliminary phase of these uh, initial, this initial way in which Dzogchen was presented in Tibet. Um, you would do this in isolation and solitude. Uh, and you push the physical body into new experiences of embodied existence uh, and, and the nature of the mind. Uh, here we see uh, you know, how these practices of the posture of the Vajra could be practiced in very remote settings here in the hidden land of Pemaka, for example. Uh, again, here depicted, um, I think the image on the, on the, unfortunately on the left is reversed, but on the right uh, we see that's actually an image by uh, Alex Gray, who anybody is familiar with his work. Um, we see the ah at the crown of the head, we see the hung at the heart center, but again reversed, but this is how it would appear because we're seeing this, um, the body from behind, this is how it would be visualized uh, by the figures. So the image isn't reversed, it's just that we're seeing it as it were, uh, while looking forward from behind uh, the figure. Uh, but the, this is the idea of how we activate uh, this inner circuitry of energy, the metaphysical anatomy of the human body uh, through a very, very dynamic practice. And by doing that very physical and, and uh, difficult posture uh, involving balance and static uh, and great strength, eventually this uh, resolves into three uh, uh, asanas, the 
posture of the lion, the elephant, and the rishi, which are used, which are easy to hold uh, comparatively, and which the mind can go into a state of profound stillness in which its own nature becomes apparent in the form of visionary displays symbolized here simply by the syllable ah, the primordial state of consciousness, which represents the, the, the unity of emptiness and appearance. So without going into that, because that's a whole subject in itself, we can see how these kind of ultimate practices within the Dzogchen tradition were uh, you used the sort of secondary adventitious appearances of, of, of appearances of light that we see here, for example, uh, with the, which can be done with the setting of the sun uh, or the rising of the sun in which we can see these spheres of light as like natural mandalas appearing within our visionary fields. And we begin to work with those as the basis for entering into kind of transpersonal states of consciousness in which those kind of naturalistic visions arising as what would be referred to in the medical tradition as entoptic phenomena within the eye uh, become opportunities for experiencing a dimension of reality uh, that goes beyond what we would commonly experience here in the sense of visions of Buddhas, for example, um, representing this again primordial consciousness, which is neither, uh, uh, to use the Buddhist term, sort of existent or non-existent. Here a yogini in a posture also associated with togal, which means leaping over the skull, literally, and a kind of the kind of visionary displays that can arise within the sky. Uh, um, this is again, there's a, in, in uh, the medical tradition would be called, called blue field and opticism. It's recognized that these kind of uh, analogous images begin to appear on a blue field. And yet, of course, these are not in the medical tradition, in an opt in optometry understood in any way as opportunities for profound states of meditation and awareness. Uh, and yet it does show that these are not something that are just purely imaginary. And here again, we see in the Six Dalai Lama's secret temple, kind of a wonderful example of the kinds of, um, you could say entry level visions that can appear when we begin to attend to what's there within the depths of a blue sky. If we look closely enough, we begin to see the grids, we begin to see the swirls, the, the peacock feather representing this efflorescence of vision uh, that arises. Um, when we begin to look at an intermediary dimension between what we normally take to be external reality and uh, internal awareness. So this kind of culminates in um, the, um, this idea of the rainbow, the rainbow body that we saw an earlier image of the Buddha dissolving from the heart center um, in the book that uh, this is in some ways a partial summary of, uh, this is the last, it's a concluding image. Uh, so I don't have it in front of me, so I can't actually share the, the quotation that goes with this, but it's from the Guyagarbha Tantra, which is one of the earliest tantras that appeared in Tibet. And it's this whole idea that when the world in reality uh, appears as a rainbow, um, we're actually seeing again, what we referred to earlier as not something that's non-existent. It's not that the world and reality is an illusion. It's just that it's different from how it normally appears. And when we begin to recognize that we're no longer in thrall to appearances, we actually play and we dance with them. And this is really, I think, the essence of the tantric Buddhist path. It's not a path of either, it's neither, it's renunciation of our conventional way in which we experience and perceive reality. And yet it's a complete embrace of the possibilities that sensual reality offers to us. And I want to end with just a few images of, of, of very uh, extraordinary female practitioners of the tradition here, Ani Rigzang in Tibet, who spent nine years in solitary retreat, perfecting these practices. Here's, she's here years later with her a prominent, a younger female disciple, uh, Ani Pema, uh, again, you know, not following the path of shaving the head and becoming a nun, but following the practice of the tradition represented by Yeshi Sogyo. So here, again, descending from the cave of, uh, of Yeshi Sogyo, where we sort of began this, this little talk, um, representing the path of the inner yogas. Uh, here again, a yogini in Bhutan uh, representing, uh, practicing a posture from the Pagmo Zaptri, representing literally the, the quintessential instructions of, uh, of Vajavarahi, a form of Vajrayogini. Uh, so again, these are our practitioners today who represent a living tradition of tantric yoga in the Himalayan world. And her teacher, Kamalatra Rinpoche, showing another posture, a posture of the Garuda, kind of a celestial hawk, 
from the same Padmozap tree, the, the quintessential instructions of Vajrayogini, uh, showing ways in which we activate uh, our, our natural uh, endowment of our own physical, psychophysical uh, body in order to bring about this kind of unification that we see symbolized in the Vajrayogini mandala itself as this union of opposites, the, 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 the male uh, triangle, as it were, uh, the upward triangle and the female uh, triangle. And in the midst of that is the, the divine nature uh, represented as the, the female Buddha, Vajrayogini. So for anyone who's interested, uh, please, you can refer to Tibetan yoga to uh, look deeper into it. And I will be really excited to, well, here's a final image of, I just want to represent the wonderful thing to me about the whole, the dynamism of the, the tantric Buddhist tradition is this efflorescence of the creative imagination and the dissolution of it, recognizing that it's all empty in the end. And yet in the midst of all of that uh, is this incredible display we see a form of uh, Padmasambhava on the left as Georgia Drollo or crazy wisdom riding on the back of a pregnant tigress. We see Dionysus himself on a leopard, um, you know, with, again, just trying to emphasize in the end that this is not an exotic tradition necessarily purely associated with, you know, the top of the world in Tibet or ancient India, but something really that arose out of a dynamic uh, interactions between East and West on the ancient Silk Road and something that we can fully honor and recognize and uh, work with as something within our own mind stream. So I will end again because it's Halloween with this image here of just the, the, the crazy wisdom, the wild and wonderful efflorescence of the, um, of the tantric uh, Buddhist world. So I will end with that and uh, go back to um, Let's see, to, hmm. I have to figure out how to, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes. So anyway, thank you very, very much. Can you hear me? Oh, absolutely. And um, that was just a stunning presentation. I have to just subjectively say that the, the chalice or skull cup feels very overflowing right now. And what, what a wonderful, wonderful way to end a series. Just, just so thorough and so captivating, Ian. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> I wonder if you just take one question. <clears throat> do you have time for one question or do you have to? I have, I have time now, so there's no limitation. Well, there is limit, some limitation, but yes, I'm very happy to take any questions that may have come up. Uh, just, just in terms of context where we find ourselves in the contemporary situation that we're in, I mean, one could stroll into a yoga class, a contemporary yoga class and receive pranayama techniques and some of the more advanced right out of the gate. And on the other hand, in the Buddhist world, these things have been very, very secretive. Even our own Lama Geshe Tenzin Zopa has been very reluctant to, to even share some of these practices. I wonder if you have comment on either side of those sort of, um, sort mm -hmm. of extremes. And then, but my real heart of my question is, if, if you had your druthers in an ideal world, how would you begin to prepare people for these kinds of practices in a modern contemporary context? What would the, some of the provisions preliminaries be in order to avoid the extremes of sort of overexposure or underexposure on either side? <clears throat> um, a great and a very important question, obviously. Um, one of the things I think is interesting, if we look at, let's just say the, the um, convention of secrecy uh, first of all, within the inner tantric tradition in Tibetan tradition, and you could say the very uh, the complete uh, lack of secrecy within the Hatha Yoga tradition, as it's currently uh, disseminated globally across the world, um, in the so-called Hindu tradition. Although what we see in Hatha Yoga today, uh, we can recognize its roots in the the Nath traditions of. Tantric Shaivism, and yet at the same, and we also recognize, and it's very, very clear within the original text, its associations with practices of what we would call, you know, Karma Mudra, or in the in that tradition, Maituna. Um, and uh, so, the thing is, what's what's happened in the Hatha Yoga tradition, for example, is you could say from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, for example, it with from the 15th century, it recognizes that uh, these were an extracted um, um, app, uh, tradition 
from the prevailing Shaiva Tantras of the time, the Shakta Tantras, that could be applicable for everyone and anyone uh, to do in the sense of health, self-healing, maintenance of health, longevity, um, and uh, a, a vital uh, life. And so I think there's nothing we can really fault in the contemporary popularity of yoga and pranayama as it's practiced uh, across the world. I think it does provide a very, very uh, powerful and very useful way of reconnecting with our physical, with physical bodies and working with the breath, obviously connecting the body and the mind. Um, and of course, there, there's a lot farther that it could go, but I think in, in, for many people, the concerns that Hatha Yoga and Pranayama already represent uh, are a profound foundation uh, for exploring the deeper levels that the inner tantric tradition can, um, can bring about. And I think the example that I brought up of Theos Bernard, uh, also from the 1930s, really addresses this point because he himself, a very highly accomplished Hatha yogin, as you saw, uh, you know, in terms of, and also the books he's done on it, done on it, but also a very, very physically accomplished on that level. But again, he recognized that this was just that the physical yogas were just the foundation for going deeper into levels of mind and consciousness that were not um, fully evident uh, within at least the traditions of Hatha yoga that he uh, had access to uh, in the Indian world uh, in which he was, was practicing it at that time. So, if we look at this, and I think if, if the holders of the Tibetan lineages uh, look at the evolution of the Hatha Yoga tradition from the Shaiva Shakta traditions and recognize that, you know, the benefits that it has actually brought about um, and the fact that so many of these practices of pranayama and, and asana that we see are actually, uh, if we look at it across, you know, uh, across the lens in the Tibetan Buddhist world are considered highly secret, they're said to be dangerous, they're said to be all kinds of things. Uh, I think it's, as I think is already happening, uh, there's a cause for reflection. Well, in what way are they dangerous? Are they simply dangerous because if they're done outside of proper guidance in the same way with Hatha Yoga, yes, we can, if we try to overextend ourselves, overstretch, yes, we can injure the spine. We can do all kinds of things that you know, we can mess ourselves up. But there's a certain sense in which I think we have to really respect the wisdom of common sense. Uh, in its original, again, Greek meaning, common sense doesn't mean what we think of it today. Common sense was when we bring all of our senses together into kind of a collective wholeness. There's a level of awareness that associated with common sense in its original meaning in ancient Greece, which I think is something we want to bring back into our lives. And it's something I think that really is inherent within these yogic traditions. Uh, so to try to answer that question more kind of concisely, I think there's an opportunity uh, from within the tradition to look at the incredible effect, popularity, and let's say beneficial effect that that uh, Hatha Yoga, let's say in its, if you want to call it a Hindu um, idiom has brought uh, to many people across the world. And to recognize that, that Tantric Buddhism offers something analogous and perhaps even uh, more powerful in the sense that it's uh, it goes deeper in terms of the ways in which this can can uh, um, access different levels of awareness and consciousness. I'll, I'll just end on that question with, I think the work that, for example, Dr. Nita Chenangsang, for example, is doing with uh, with what's called Nejang Yoga. This is coming from the Kala Chakra tradition. It's a very accessible form of uh, 24 movements that are connected with the 24 sacred places of the yogini tantras. There are also the 24 places that have their inner correlates within our physical bodies. They're ways of activating that inner awareness as well as opening up the chakras and the subtle energy flows within the body in a very, in a way in which uh, no harm can be done per se. And there are two ways in which it's done. One of which is with normal breathing, if you will, and one of which is done with the held breath, the kumbhaka. And so the kumbhaka breath, which again, if it's over, if it's overdone and, and not done properly, can potentially cause some kind of uh, imbalance in the nervous system. But if it's done properly, it brings about great benefit. So for example, I think that's a great example of a tradition that is being more and more taught openly. Nejang, Dr. Nida has recently come out with a book called Nejang. 
Um, and uh, he and I actually gave a couple of talks recently together. I was fortunate enough to be able to spend some time with him south of Rome. And I really am very excited about that work. And I think that's opening up. Uh, that's right from the Kala Chakra Tantra. And I think it's going to open up possibilities within other so-called hard essence traditions in which these inner yogas and the physical yogas uh, can begin to be contextualized in ways that can only bring benefit. Well, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I, um, there's just two little questions here. I just want to make sure uh, yep. Lorraine asks, um, do the deity practice such as Tara, because our group has been practicing Tara, are they, are they part of this overall process and what, what, what way, where, where would the Tara practices fit into the overall process? And, and, and a kind of secondary question is about, what about diet? Uh, we're talking about energy, food is so important. Where, and, and then the final one would be, you, you end your book, I think, with a chapter on uh, psychedelics. Uh -huh. uh, so where they might fit in. So where, where does, where does screen Tara diet and psychedelics fit into the overall uh, schema of the yoga, uh, the Tibetan yoga practices? And we'll, we'll end with that. Okay. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm really happy about the question about green Tara because there's something that I haven't fully been able to explore yet. And yet there are Tibetan texts connected with Tara that have a specific tradition uh, connected with the Trulkor. So the yogic exercises, physical yoga is connected with a particular tradition of green Tara. And that um, is work that I think was first introduced by uh, Elio. Um, uh, I will have to find, before I misquote anything, I will find the reference for it and share that with you so that you can explore that further with your group. But it's very, very, there's a very direct reference to that as a, connection between the physical practices of Tara connected as, you know, an enlightened, uh, an expression of enlightened um, um, Buddha nature uh, in female form with the Salong and Trulkor practices, the working with the, the magical wheel of, uh, of channels and winds. So I will, I will uh, uh, share that with you uh, afterwards. And then as far as nutrition, of course, it's a very, very profound part of the Tibetan medical tradition before taking particular um, uh, medicines, uh, uh, herbal medicines are made also with herbs and medicine uh, and uh, minerals and even animal parts. Nutrition was the first uh, approach towards balancing the, the inner humors of the body, the nyepa, as they were called in the Tibetan tradition. So this is very important in the sense that nutrition is a way of balancing uh, as is seen in Tibetan tradition as a way of balancing the five elements and these five elements connected with the five chakras and those same five chakras and the three channels connected with the so-called nyepas or the humors that we know of in Ayurveda as vata, pitta, kapha or begin, um, 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 which I'm just speaking out the name, uh, lung and tripa in the Tibetan tradition. And those in turn associated with the, uh, the, the, you know, the ignorance, greed, and delusion that we purify um, through these uh, inner yogic practices. But we also begin to purify those and harmonize those through diet. So there are specific guidelines. Uh, and again, this is something that I think Dr. Nita's work is one of the best in beginning in taking some of the ancient uh, Tibetan medical uh, guidelines on nutrition and bringing them up to date in the contemporary world. And also what's interesting in that tradition is particular herbal uh, formulations that can be used in connection with the, uh, the yogic practices in order to optimize them, whether it's Tumo or, or, or Poa, for example. So that's something, again, I think that uh, we can look into more extensively later. Um, but then, you know, the very, uh, what we, I guess we would call in contemporary terms, the controversial subject of how can, um, how does nutrition extend from body to mind in the form of psychotropic substances? So in other words, substances that affect the mind uh, very overtly. And there is a chapter in my book that deals with a word, I don't know if it existed before called uh, entheopharmacology. There's ethnopharmacology, which we know, which is the use of, of tradition of uh, medicinal substances uh, within 
uh, within traditional cultures, but entheopharmacology, entheo meaning entheogens is often used as a synonym for today for psychedelics, entheo meaning that which produces the divine within or the God within. So entheogens are, uh, uh, which we know from contemporary research at John Hopkins Medical University, for example, as done with psilocybin mushrooms, um, with other ergot-based substances like lysergic acid, dimethylamide, ways in which um, one can transcend our ordinary conceptions of who and what we are through this dynamic um, effect brought about by basically almost subliminal um, use of very, very powerful substances. And, um, <clears throat> I think you know there's a long there's a long history as that the chapter in my book uh, really brings out. There's you know Mahakala Tantra, the Kala Chakra, Chakra Samvara Tantra. There's clear evidence of the use of psychotropic substances within the Buddhist tantras. Although if you ask lamas about it, often they'll just say no, it doesn't exist because it's just it's an inconvenient fact. Let's just say, and sometimes we know that history gets reworked because we need history is. And unfortunately, in the Tibetan tradition, history is often what sort of suits the moment and the occasion and the needs of a particular tradition in order to be perpetuated in a particular way. Uh, so what I tried to do in that chapter was just to kind of open the idea that uh, these substances have been used. We know they are very, very extensively used within the Shaiva Tantras, for example. And so obviously it's not in any way surprising that they were part of the Buddhist Tantras as well. And I think a lot of evidence shows, as I also, again, in that chapter, try to bring out how these have been used very productively with the right set and setting uh, to bring about really life-changing experiences. Um, and that goes for psilocybin mushrooms. It goes for you know, dimethyltryptamine, you know, active ingredient in ayahuasca, for example. And there's certainly experimental groups that have tried, you know, to, you know, give almost like a bar, there have been bardo teachings based upon, you know, the, the, those participating all uh, taking, um, you know, microdoses of, uh, or let's just say sub doses of, of, of ayahuasca and dimethyltryptamine in order to point out the nature of the bardo experience. So I think, again, what we're seeing here is just to kind of sum up, because I know it's the last question, so just is a way in which the beautiful thing for me about the Buddhist Tantras is it kind of went beyond the, pal the Pali canon in order to become a very syncretic tradition that brought about, and we see that in the Kala Chakra. So was, you know, brought about the best of, best of what was available in terms of the knowledge of astronomy, astrology, anatomy, um, alchemy, medicine, uh, and spiritual practices and yoga you know, in the, in the 11th century. And what we're seeing now a thousand years later is an opportunity to create a new grand synthesis, looking at the deeper history of Tantra and to continue that creativity and innovation that is really at the heart of the Tantric tradition. And so not just therefore to be involved with preserving a tradition as it was inherited in Tibet from the eighth century onward, but to see now in this Western world in which we're in, what we can contribute to the further evolution of Buddhist Tantra through the kind of incredible advances that have been made uh, on all f uh, aspects of knowledge, um, you know, over the, the past few centuries. So I guess that's my final sort of comment to that question. Ian, I just, that's a wonderful way to end because uh, as Alice and I look forward to the, uh, what's beyond CSP or Contemplative Studies program has been focused on really the, uh, the educational part. We're really developing now uh, a sort of vision for a, a kind of collaborative praxis. Uh, we're gonna really focus on practice and, and really bringing in astrology and medicine and energy work. And so uh, we really hope that you and Dr. Nita will join us in that effort. And we'd, we'd very much, very much like to uh, plant a seed now for future collaboration and invite you back if, if you have the time and patience for us. We are eager and willing and ready to go very, very deep into these things, which you've, in a way, you've been an ambassador for and, and, a, and a storehouse keeper of the, the great lineages of the wisdom traditions of your of your mentors and so uh, we find we're so honored to have met you and so honored to have had this exposure and and but but we will inundate your inbox with requests uh, <laughs> and, and until until you uh, until you agree to come back and, and go deeper after this uh, sort of um you know op opening opening remarks we're, we're ready to go into the practices 
Uh, so I, I do, I do hope, I do hope we, we meet again very, very soon. And we, we want to mm -hmm. wish you all the best uh, with your continued work. And we very much hope to, uh, to re reconnect with you very, very soon for, for a deeper exploration. So all best wishes on behalf of the Contemplative Studies Program, all my friends here, uh, wherever we are across the planet. Thank you so much for all your life's work and all that you do and that wonderful, wonderful presentation and synthesis from art uh, to philosophy to energy practice and medicine. So, so, so rich and so wonderful. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I look forward very much to, to rejoining you again for further, further dialogue and discussion. So all best for now. Take good care. Enjoy the howling winds. Well, they are howling right now. I don't know if you hear them, but it's, it's a wild, they're like banshees outside my window at the moment. It's the Dakinis calling us. I think so. Practice. That's it. Oh, thank you so much, Ian. And thank you everybody for, uh, for wonderful attendance, participation, all your wonderful energy, wherever you are, whether you're in the contemplative studies program or watching live stream. Thank you so much for participating so fully. And uh, that concludes our Tantra series, but it's not just the ending, it's the beginning of new uh, for future frontiers. And so we will see you very, very soon. All best wishes to everybody.